This is the grand space of the building. This is the culmination of the great architectural symphony and a masterpiece of the art of the Tiffany Glass and Decorating Company combined with the design skills of Charles A. Coolidge. We have veined Carrara marble now, instead of having ones that's just a dead white of the lower floors. The mosaics in the lower area are simple little twinkling strips. If you kind of walk around, the building will wink and twinkle at you as you walk through. But then the big arches that go up, all in delicate mosaic, and incorporated into them in the corners, are symbols that actually go back to the 15th and 16th century, where the early book publishers who had symbols, kind of like trademarks, that would identify their works. So, example, in the corner here is a French book publisher, Roland Gautier, and that was the mark that he would put in his books. On the other side is a symbol of another early French book publisher, Pierre de Chandelier. Chandelier means candle, and so they work into the design, a candelabra. That was very common in publishers' marks, but they also called printer's marks at the time. Even one called Mallet, M-A-L-L-E-T, and there is a glass mallet over on the other side. Now the work of assembling all of these mosaics was done in the shops at Tiffany Glass and Decorating Company and then brought to Chicago. It was not all done one at a time on the site. They were designed in panels to be fitted together with irregular sides that matched perfectly like a puzzle so that you don't see the joints. The work of doing this is absolutely virtuoso in terms of matching of glass. If you have a piece of art glass, even though it seems to be one color, when you break it into tiny pieces, there are all kinds of variations of the color. It's knowing how to arrange those together to make a beautiful shaded pattern is part of the art. Tiffany's assembly department who put these together was originally all men. In a labor dispute, fired them all and the shop was taken over by women. A team that was led by a woman named Clara Driscoll and was known in the trade as the Tiffany Girls. In fact, we now know through letters that have been found that Clara Driscoll was the designer of many of the famous Tiffany Studios lamps that now will generate hundreds of thousands of dollars in antique auctions. The people who ran Tiffany were so impressed with the ability to arrange and match the glass so beautifully they said that they wished they would brought the women in to begin with because they did a much better job. But then there's not just the Tiffany executed mosaics. We have the Tiffany executed dome above our head that brings natural light into the space. You can see the classical scalloped pattern and actually one thing that you don't notice is the higher you go, the slightly darker the glass gets. This draws your eye up and gives an extra sense of lift to it. And then at the very center of the dome, you can see the symbols of the zodiac. A big light fixture hangs from the center. It actually was not planned to be there at all, but came in within a few months. They probably determined they needed additional light. Building this building was a serious thing, but the architect still, I think, had some fun with this, perhaps in collaboration with the librarians, in that just back from where I'm standing here was a counter that separated where the public would be and where the librarians were. And the idea was that you ordered your books with your call slip, they would go back to the stacks and deliver them to you. So this is the great delivery room. Around the dome is a heroic quotation about books being the legacies passed from generation to generation. It's no accident that the word delivered winds up being right centered over the librarian's heads. In the back corner here, you see a YCPL. 
that is a symbol that was used by the Chicago Public Library. And it's a symbol of Y that was used throughout municipal buildings in the city. In fact, they called it the municipal device. It is the main branch of the Chicago River, the branching of the north and the south branches. The quadrants are the west side, north side, and south side worked into the mosaics. We also have beautiful hanging light fixtures that the design of them impartially derives according to some documents that we have from excavations of the ancient city of Pompeii. Pompeii was being excavated at the time this building was being built and the finds in terms of the color and the decoration was being published in monographs and circulated and eagerly sought by architects and designers. Included in the room are marble plaques that have inscriptions. Each one is a real quotation that will be about books, reading, and knowledge. These were picked out by Mr. Hill, the chief librarian. There are things in Chinese, a quote from Confucius. Many different languages and cultures are represented. Behind me is an elevator that was used to move books for the librarians. And it was actually based on an old Spanish church altar screen, now very nicely converted into a 19th century elevator. Those aren't operational anymore. There's a lot to see in Preston Bradley Hall, and there's a lot of surprises waiting for you if you come visit it for yourself. There's one part that I can never convey to you in this format, and that's what it's like to see the space in three dimensions. You can move through space, things will change, they will shift. You've got the mosaics sparkling and twinkling, giving you a surprise with every turn. How often can you have a building that can do something like that? And also look around. You can see the name of Shakespeare, for example, spelled in a way that you're not used to seeing. Is it a typo? I'm not saying. But anyway, it's worth coming down to see. The room has a lot of wonders and surprises just waiting for you to discover. All you have to do is come and see it for yourself. <laughs>